six. And now that I've got your attention, vote part. This is a poster joke from a season two episode of The Simpsons, Lisa's Substitute, where Bart is running for class president. Homer comes up with the idea to make this poster as part of his campaign. And it got me thinking. Sex. And now that I've got your attention, we're actually gonna talk about sex and gender and queerness and bodies and Christianity and money and apocalyptic ecclesiology and politics and death and so much more. Because all of this and not apologetics is the purview of queer theology. According to the author who literally wrote the book on queer theology because it is called Queer Theology. Today on Love, Rinse, Repeat, I talk with Lynn Marie Tonstad, Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at Yale Divinity School, author of God and Difference and the Cascade Companion, Queer Theology. This is a phenomenal book. I mean, it shifted, opened up and reoriented so much of my thinking. It unsettled categories, it gave vocabulary, it asked questions to which I will continually return. It put to bed so many tired discussions and awoke a whole array of conversations about the world, our place in it, and our hopes for it. I'm very excited that I got the chat to Lynn and I hope you enjoy this conversation which touches on so many important and vital conversations, not least a critical engagement with capitalism. So stick around for that. So wherever you are, whatever room or form of public transport you're in, I want hands together, round of applause. Please welcome Lynn Marie Tonstad to Love, Rinse, Repeat. Well, Lynn Marie Tonstad, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we're talking about your book, Queer Theology, which is available now and has been for some time and you can go and check out and buy. And hopefully at the end of this interview, you will have already ordered it. Uh, what, I guess, led you to, to write the book and have there been any surprises either in the, the process of writing or in its reception? Those are great questions. Uh, so what led me to write the book originally was a conversation that I ended up, and as it turns out, end up, I'll get back to that in a moment, having with my students pretty much every time I teach a good seminar in queer theology, which I do every couple of years, pretty much. And the conversation was about what queer theology should be about. Students who are coming from a variety of different backgrounds, about half of them are so are in preparation for ministerial work of some kind, and the rest are doing nonprofit or preparation for doctoral work or, or, and so on, and some are doctoral students. But students were very concerned that what queer theology should be about was making the case in fairly concrete struggles in local churches for why it's okay to be gay, basically. And I got tired of having that conversation over and over. And it wasn't just because, as the book describes, that isn't for me a live question, and I don't think it should be, um, but also because it, I worried that it was really constraining the possibilities of what queer theology could be and really constraining the possibilities of thinking in more interesting, expansive, and creative ways about what sexuality and Christianity may or may not have to do with each other. And I ended up uh, more or less sitting down to write a book that I intended to use in part to convince my students that queer theology could be something other than what it often has been. I, it hasn't only, of course, been apologetic. There's been a variety of conversations around um, how we might approach the Christian tradition differently if we recognize that it has more flexibility around issues of gender than has often been assumed and so on and so forth. But, but, but apologetics have really been the dominant uh, sort of conversations in that area. And as it turns out, now that I signed the book for the first time this semester, we still ended up having that conversation for most of the time. Um, but at least having it in a, in a, in a more interesting way, I think. Um, mm because it, 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 did, it did open the door for, um, it, 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 it assisted students in gaining a vocabulary for thinking about these questions in a way that was more um, open to uh, things that aren't reducible to the minutia of denominational and polity issues, mm -hmm. which is often so much their concern. Mm. So yes. that was 
you know, that was both surprising and, and exciting in some ways about the response. It didn't do exactly what I hoped, but it also did end up generating a lot of conversation that I think was, was good and interesting. Well, that's exciting. Yes. And, and perhaps uh, after a few more years of being assigned uh, in, in seminars. Hey, fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I was careful not to assign it at the very start of the semester because I didn't want to prejudice the conversation mm. too much. So we'll see. Maybe I'll try different strategies later on. <laughs> uh, so you, you mentioned there, you know, you've already touched on that. You know, queer theology is, should not just be about apologetics. Uh, and then in, in the second chapter of the book, you kind of rehearse a number of the apologetic arguments that are already out there and, and, and point out sometimes some shortcomings or shallowness in these approaches. Um, what's interesting is that as you touch on one of the arguments, uh, the argument around food laws and the Bible, that ends up kind of providing uh, an apologetic for not having apologetics to some extent. Right. It, it opens right. the door for actually why I don't need to be having these arguments. Do you want to explore that a little bit for us? That's so well put. And I wish I'd talked to you before I finished that <laughs> chapter because that would have been a great line to use for that. <laughs> yeah, so the argument from food uses a variety of biblical sources, but especially obviously then Romans, Romans 14, to talk about the role of individual conscience and the different ways that you can read Paul's discussion of those with strong consciousnesses and, uh, or those with strong faith and those with weak faith. And the argument from food pretty much says, whatever your convictions are, the key is not to hurt your siblings in faith in a variety of ways. And if you think about that as, as, as a kind of structure for disagreement about issues that it's easy for us often to say, oh, food is adiaphora. It's not a matter of fundamental uh, faithfulness or not. It's not a matter of orthodoxy. People have different preferences. Some people eat pigs and some people eat, you know, um, leaves that fall off of trees or whatever the case may be. But of course the Bible doesn't see it that way. The Bible taken as a whole is extremely concerned about food and who should eat what and when and under what circumstances and in what company. And as we know, this, these kinds of disagreements were absolutely essential to the generation of Christianity itself. So you can't either do the supersessionist thing and say, oh, Jews care about food, but Christians don't. That's not true at all. <laughs> and in fact, if you make claims like that, it's not just that you're doing bad theology, it's that you're being unfaithful to the origins of Christianity itself. Now there's more to say about the origins of Christianity than that, but at any rate, it's been there all along. And so if you take disagreements about food then as a kind of model and you recognize the significance that they have to any number of different narratives and perspectives in the Bible, then you can sort of see what Paul says there uh, about eating uh, different kinds of food and eating food with different sort of relationships, both to what we would call religion and ritual practices and, and so on and so forth. And uh, those who, and, as well as food that has you know, what we would think of as maybe different ethical implications in terms of the recognition of the effects that global warming are going to have and the connection to the eating of meat and so on. I mean, this is really live for a lot of Christians. And so there's potential here to say these are issues that matter. It's not that they don't matter, but they don't matter in such a way that you can use them as a basis for deciding who's in and out in terms of Christianity. And they don't mean in a way that you can use them to judge the Christianity of your sibling in one way or another. So it's tricky because it is exactly, as you say, a kind of apologetics for not doing apologetics. It's a way of talking about something that does matter and is significant. This isn't just tra-la-la, whatever, right? There's a, there's a lot to be said and there's a lot that Paul is saying uh, in that text. But it is something that... I think, and as I say in that chapter, especially combined with a couple of other perspectives that also have sort of Pauline ankles to them, uh, which I just think is kind of entertaining, but also, you know, there is no Christianity without Paul, right? That's, that's just how it is. Um, it, 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 helps, it helps to provide a way to think about disagreement around these issues that's a lot freer, I think, than, than it's typically been. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think that people should take these fights when they are forced upon them in a certain sense, right? But it's not liberal or Christians who are um, affirming in a variety of ways who have typically decided to split denominations over this issue. That's been something that's been done by people who have very different views. 
And so that's what I mean by kind of being brought to do when they have to have that I, I don't want to call it an argument exactly <laughs> because I don't think it goes on the basis of argument, but one may have to do the work in that regard when it is brought to one in such a way that one has to do it. Mm. But here's a model for not thinking about this as the sort of thing on which denominations should split, for instance. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's very helpful. And I was thinking about your, the kind of the talking about how this is kind of, you know, saying that, you know, this shouldn't be the matter by which we judge uh, our, our siblings and, uh, I think that kind of dovetails a bit into a later section of the book where you, you engage your work on apocalyptic ecclesiology, uh, that we are not like the bringers of God's judgment, but it's target. And that, you know, we need to be far less concerned about who we give the body of Christ since, you know, as the ascended body, it's not present with us anyway. Um, how do you see kind of the giving up of judgment in, in apologetics and in, in, in debate? Um, shaping the kind of form and purpose and concern of the church. Nice. Yeah, there's a kind of freedom that I think results from that, right? Um, and I understand both in terms of theology and the theological academy and in terms of the concerns of many people who are involved in, in church work in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. I understand the concerns that often drive starting the, the worries around these kinds of issues, right? the sense that uh, Christianity of the types that many people are attached to is losing its significance in all the sort of the narratives of decline in so many different contexts that we have and the fears that are associated with that, the attachments that are associated to that. Um, but I do think there's a kind of freedom, right? This is the part of my work that is, you know, um, whether I like it or not, almost in a radical Protestant, right? <laughs> that there's something about recognizing yourself as the target of judgment and of course, you know, only the sinner is the one for whom forgiveness is directed, right? Only the sinner is the one for whom Jesus comes. If you recognize that, then there does seem to be at least the possibility of a freedom that isn't about being good, but that is something more like being present, being with the world, in the world in a different way that doesn't require a kind of boundary maintenance of, of the kind that, that, as I suggest in the, in the chapter that, um, in the God and Difference book where that argument was first developed, uh, puts you at risk of shutting Jesus out. Because as, as my mentor, Marilyn McCord Adams used to say, uh, Jesus was crucified outside the gates, right? At least symbolically and probably literally as well. <laughs> And so there's something about the sort of recognizing that the church's greatest danger, and, and there are other you know, deep strands in, in Protestantism that are, that are associated with this, that the church's greatest danger is religion in a certain way, right? The, the church's greatest danger is, is its best impulses. And so to kind of, in a certain sense, give up on those best impulses, impulses towards goodness and towards purity and towards faithfulness and so on. And instead to have a kind of freedom there that recognizes that, that, that um, theologically speaking, these are issues that are, they belong to God, ultimately, I think then allows for one's attention and one's energies to be directed in ways that will be much more um, churchy in the best sense of the word, actually. And that will also allow the um, doing, I, I, I think about this under the sort of difference between doing the good and doing better, right? Doing the good is a temptation for Christians. But doing better, like aiming at the better, there could be less violence, there could be less hunger, there could be less poverty, right? Aiming at the better, then that's a possibility both for church work and for cooperation with a variety of other religious and non-religious actors in the world. Mm, that's really good and, and very helpful. And, uh, and it kind of gets into a bit of what you're kind of talking about in the book that, you know, as queer theology is not just about apologetics, so its aims are not just about kind of grafting on LGBTIQ plus people into the form and rights and structure of church and, and society. Um, and I mean, thinking about my own context, because, you know, Australia only recently, like in, in legislature passed marriage equality, then my own denomination, the Uniting Church, just recently had the big vote on like whether we would have a right of marriage for um, same sex couples. Uh, and so, so much of the energy around this has been just in this one kind of area in ex extending something that already existed. 
Um, but I guess, you know, as you're saying, it's, it's, we maybe limited the scope of what we think of when we think of queer theology or what we expect from it. So I guess, how do we begin to widen the expectation? How do we begin to think about a much more, you know, disruptive or a much just more fundamental shift in our thinking than, than simply a, a expansion or a grafting? Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly the task. And that's where um, queer theology, at a minimum as an analytic, and hopefully also as something a bit more than that, I think really does potentially have a lot to contribute. You know, I've done some um, research recently following uh, a researcher in Sweden, Daniel Enstedt, who looks at uh, the kind of rhetoric that led up, starting in the 1970s, to the Swedish church's decision to bless and then later marry same-sex couples. And he shows that a distinction emerged that I've seen in a lot of contexts between something like genuine homosexuality, which is about love and identity and authenticity and the deepest impulses that are in a human being and so on, and sort of not so good homosexuality, which would be like excessive promiscuity or something like that, or sex work or things like that. You know, that's not, that's still not okay. And so what ended up happening in that debate and what ends up happening in many churches is that the dynamics of including some queer people are the same dynamics that excluded them in the first place. And that sort of deepened the structures of um, the, not, not who's being brought in, but the, the, the structure of uh, inclusion and exclusion, or that's not my language so much as like the production of hierarchical relationships between differently stigmatized groups of human beings. And we see this in so many contexts in the way that um, you sort of, as I talk about a bit in the book, you, you, you distinguish between kind of dignified rights having individuals and individuals who are indecent or improper in some way that don't really deserve these fundamental rights. And right now, Australia, the US and Europe, at a minimum, have all joined each other in making immigration and migration questions an extremely clear example of this dynamic. I just saw an essay, uh, maybe yesterday or thereabouts here in the US, where the argument is being made that one needs to um, defend against climate refugees so that you can bring in refugees who are fleeing uh, tyranny. Now, what's, what's the logic of like who's going to get in and who's not, right? It has to do with this idea that economics are kind of a little bit up to you and, and a bit your own fault, whereas tyranny is maybe something that happens to you. And, you know, rights are for those who are fleeing tyranny, not for those who are simply poor or simply being driven to migration by climate disasters, right? And so to my mind, the, the queer theology that I want to see and want to be a part of is targeting that fundamental structure more than um, the making arguments for, for, for the decency or, or acceptability of particular groups of LGBTQ plus people. And that's where I think politically, as well as theologically, a lot of work obviously remains to be done. And that work is really urgent right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting about bringing up the migrant thing because so often um, a lot of the pitch for around like welcoming migration is, hey, it's good for the economy. Like see what happens. They start businesses. Um, you know, look, oh, they're the good news stories of this kid who came as a migrant who now topped his class and is going to, yeah. to university. And, and so it was interesting. I was thinking about in the book, you kind of talk about uh, that. Uh, where is the thing? Oh, um, one of the things queer theology should concern itself with is, is a critical engagement with capitalism, you know, taking a stand against this distortive power. Uh, and so some people might be listening to this and thinking, wait a second, I thought queer theology was about uh, sex and gender. Why are we now talking about uh, capitalism? So I guess you, you started to touch on in that last answer um, that it's about the, you know, breaking apart this, you know, decent and indecent. But can you talk a little bit about more about how you know, this is actually about, again, that bigger picture. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, part of this is about the sort of evolution in, in early modernity and then in modernity of uh, the particular systems of organizing sex and gender that are dominant in the West at this time. That's the sort of classic angles on the origin of the family, private property, and the state, right? The sort of interconnection between those things, the way that the regulation of mainly women's sexuality is connected to the need to, to be uh, sure that your property is going to your own genetic offspring. 
and, and so on and so forth. So part of that is genealogical, right? The sort of organization that we have now, and you can think about this too in terms of the eight hour working day and the question of social reproduction, that is who takes care of the children during the day and how that gets organized both in terms of gender and in terms of migration type questions in, in the West especially. And you know, what, what's, the, what's the structure that allows somebody to be out of the house for a certain, for a significant amount of time every day, right? And that still allows for the survival of those who can't take care of themselves in, in those circumstances. So that's probably the genealogical side of it. And then the contemporary side of it, right? Um, there's, uh, there's so much more abject poverty in the world than the total resources of the world, whether you read those in terms of money or not would suggest is necessary, right? There's a really fundamental mismatch between this, and we see this especially, at least in the terms that are most visible to people, in the incredible uh, wealth inequality that we have at the moment that's simply unprecedented in human history. There was no Roman landowner who was wealthy on the scale that the world's billionaires are now. There's simply no comparison between those things. And this is the result of really concrete policy decisions. It's not actually the result of like, this is just endemic to capitalism. This is how it works. Da -da 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 -da. If you look at the amount of state and government regulation that is required to produce markets, to keep markets running, and so on and so forth, and then at the consequences of financial deregulation and what happened with that in the 80s in particular, um, and, and we can talk more about some of the concrete dynamics of all of this, but what's happening now is not how it needs to be. And what's happening now is not, I think, very, very clearly not in tune with the sort of fundamental theological conviction, which is that it's God's will that the creature may live and God's will that the creature may flourish. And that God, at least in the place that Christians are taught to look for God, i.e. the practices and teachings of Jesus, um, does not distinguish between the hardworking and the not so hardworking. And that's the point that Jesus makes, of course, famously in very concrete economic terms. You arrive at the end of the day and did basically nothing, you get the same as those who work very hard every day. And when you think about where the church has the potential to be radical, right, the sort of acts for they held all things in common, I'm not saying it's an answer that could be implemented in any direct and easy way, but there are resources for thinking about this as really crucial to Christianity, to what it at least has the potential to be, right? And, and so I think, um, and there is more to be said about the sort of economic sides of distinguishing between those who, who live their sexuality and gender properly and those who don't than the ways that uh, a kind of general social uh, increase in acceptance of uh, trans people and genderqueer people and same gender loving people may also be connected to a more general move towards need for fluidity in workers so that you sort of give workers the permission to have this fluidity in their personal, quote unquote, personal sexual lives, uh, gendered lives. Um, because you need that as a value in the workplace now that, you know, the gig economy and startups, and, you know, all, all, all the sort of things that have to do with instability, or we could call it fluidity, right, in people's work lives that actually render them incredibly vulnerable. But sexuality and gender can become sort of training arenas in some ways, or at least arenas where you get permission to be fluid in these ways um, that, that are deeply actually connected to what capitalism needs from you at this point in time. Mm. No, that's really helpful and, and, and so much of a thing to be thinking about, you know, these, these huge structural shifts that need to happen and the church's place in that as, you know, actually able to take concrete steps as a, uh, you know, as a community to, in, in, within their communities and within their nations to, to challenge this is such an important step going forward. And, and as you say, it's, it's, it's all connected into each other. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, one of the oh sorry uh, one of the uh, like a, a thing that runs through the book a good challenge I, I found that ran through the book was that um, identification is never complete uh, this idea there's no identity out there somewhere you know invulnerable fixed and final uh, our, our story of sex and gender is on the move as is God's story with humankind um, and if I've captured that 
appropriately or somewhat somewhat accurately how does that i guess form and shape you know the, the work of theology and the work of queer theology if, if there's not this kind of you know eventual thing we can just go that's what that is and, and we'll get there right right <laughs> Yes, I, this is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, one of the people I've worked on in, in the other side of my work that doesn't have to do with the sort of queer theological side, at least directly, but is my kind of classical German systematic theology side is Wolfhard Pannenberg, right, for whom um, he died just a few years ago, but the sort of central uh, point that he wanted to make theologically, and he had a lot of other things to say that were of uh, um, different degrees of eccentricity, we might say at a minimum, but he worked really hard to make the case that theological statements are hypothetical as long as history continues. That doesn't mean they're, they're, they have no relationship to truth. It doesn't mean they're just speculation, because it's precisely in history that the world and human beings and God's relationship to the world is taking its concrete shape. But precisely because human beings are created as temporal and historical creatures, that has consequences for what we can say and what we can imagine, at least the finality with which we can say and imagine it theologically. And that's been an incredibly important insight for me. I don't do with it exactly what Ponenberg does, but I've thought a lot about it because it seems to name something that is really difficult to capture theologically, precisely because it has to do with the only church there is, is the historical church in a certain sense. The only humans there are are actually existing humans in a certain sense. The only world there is, 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 is this world, right? And, and, and to think about what that means for the ideas that we systematic theologians like to think about and toss around, like human nature or truth or dogma or whatever the case may be. Now, again, this isn't a question of just say whatever appears to you, but it is a recognition that one of the most, um, shall we say, uh, faithful, I want to say with slight scare quotes because I'm suspicious of these kinds of impulses, but one of the most faithful things you can say is that God created human beings as historical temporal material creatures. That's fundamental to any Christian theology, I think. And so what it means to take that seriously, what it means to take seriously that we are always on the move, and that the toward is not necessarily always clear nor given to us in, in a kind of pre-given, predetermined way. You have now arrived at your destination sort of sense. Um, that, that, that's something that uh, theology still struggles to think about in helpful ways. And it's also something that many queer theorists have done a pretty good job of thinking about, at least on the individual level. Maybe not so much on, in, in terms of, uh, maybe not so much in, ter in historical terms, but definitely in individual and social terms. Thinking about what it means to imagine a goal that is a full, complete, transparent identity. Again, for human beings, that would at best only be achievable in death, because that's when the story ends in a certain sense. That's the only end that there is, at least for now, however, however one wants to think about that. Um, and socially, there's a real danger if one, if one aims at, let's say, total inclusion or something like that, of everybody, then there's a real danger that your targets become those who stand in opposition to inclusion, right? That you then sort of have to go after those who aren't part of this completely inclusive social vision that you imagine yourself to have. And that's a pretty intractable type of antagonism. You can't so easily get around it. And it's one, again, that queer theorists have thought really, really hard about, and where I think theologians could both learn and contribute in, in those conversations in ways that hasn't yet happened. Yeah, I thought one of the ways you captured that was in that types of inclusion language of trying to include more in the language of God, right? We were trying to include more of yeah. like a, a feminine side of God or a, a, a queer side of Jesus, that there's this thing of, well, you're still naming exactly what that is and what those attributes are, which then keeps those who aren't that or who have work, you know, on the outside. Absolutely. And, and, and it, you, you have to know what you're looking for and you have to sort of recognize it in there in order to name it in a way that, yeah, I think is, is really uh, both ineffective and, and dangerous in certain ways. Um, 
Yeah. So, so while people are obviously just reminding buying queer theology, uh, one of your uh, main conversation partners in the book uh, is is Marcella uh, Althus Reed. Uh, let's let's give the elevator pitch that while they've got their basket open, they should also look at at, at her work uh, and, and and check that out. Well, in some ways, it's a hard case to make because she's incredibly difficult to read. And, and sometimes quite frustrating to read as well. Um, Marcela Althaus Reed was an Argentinian theologian who died in 2009 when she was teaching at the University of Edinburgh. When she was appointed professor of contextual theology there in 2006, she was the only woman professor of theology in Scotland, um, which is, there are a lot of professors of theology in Scotland and I think very, very highly of any number of them, <laughs> um, but that is an astonishing uh, reality. And she writes in this very impressionistic way um, and very creative and, and very frustrating. She, she often uses citations that she doesn't really work out. It, there's a kind of elusiveness and a creativity to her writing. And in, in queer theology, I try to show what I think that's doing in mm -hmm. certain ways so that it will be in a way maybe easier to read her <laughs> after, after reading me. And fundamentally, one of the things she's concerned about is just the thing we were talking about a few minutes ago around decency and deservingness and inclusion and exclusion and this sort of distinction between like you know good authentic loving queer people and sort of the improper you know sex workers etc that still need to be kept out of uh, sort of inclusion in Christianity despite the fact that you know Jesus liked to kick it with them all the time sort of thing um, and uh, at least that's one of the stories we hear. And she, uh, she had this incredibly creative way of doing what I call maybe over-literalizing. So taking some of the sort of central themes in Christianity, some of the stories were told, and just re-describing them in these very vivid ways that she hopes will help us to see that sex and gender are not something that queer theologians read into Christian stories. They're always there, but there's an incredible um, sort of almost, I would call it like an infrastructure on top of that already there that hides from us the ways in which these are stories about also about sex and gender and the weirdness and impossibility of some of those stories. So, you know, she'll talk about um, Mary's, uh, you know, stonewalled hymen, for instance. And, you know, that sounds kind of shocking. Why are we talking about Mary's hymen? Well, you know, Hans Urs von Balthasar, the great 20th century Catholic theologian who was a significant influence on John Paul II, spends a, a significant amount of time in his work speculating on how Mary's hymen must have moved aside so that Jesus could pass through without breaking it when he was born. So this is there, right? It's not something that queer theologians are putting there. In fact, these are stories that are actually uh, part of the story, as it were, um, from the beginning in various ways. And so uh, Althaus Reed helps us to see that, I think, and helps us to think about the consequences, both of that reality, that these stories about sex and gender are there, and about what it is that has made it possible for us not to see that. In my own work, the sort of typical example that I've always gone to is the sort of statement, you know, God the Father has nothing to do with human fatherhood or with maleness, but he must be called Father, right? And somehow this statement that the gendered aspect of it is ineluctable, is inescapable, has to be kept, but it's not about gender, Right? What is it that makes that possible for theologians to say so comfortably? What is it that has allowed that kind of development? Where something that is also clearly connected to Christian historical practices of valuing men over women in all kinds of ways um, is, is at the same time presented to us as this isn't about gender. Well, clearly it is, right? So how is it that we are so convinced that this isn't about gender? What makes that possible? Oswald Reed is a wonderful, um, illustrator and a diagnostician, I think, of that. And the second thing I, I think is really important about her work is the thing we've been talking about already, which is the economy. The emphasis on never thinking sexuality apart from economy, 
and not sort of going to uh, what what many people in the academy would talk about this kind of neoliberal homo nationalism, <laughs> which means put into uh, more ordinary and far more charming language, means something more like um, it is part of being a good American citizen or a good European citizen or a good Australian citizen that we are now tolerant and inclusive of gay and queer people, unlike all these formerly colonized countries that haven't yet come to this level of enlightenment and so on and so forth. And so that uh, inclusion then also becomes a kind of tool for colonialism and for maintaining colonial structures. And Altas Reid is really helpful in, in, in making clear some of these connections, I think. There are things to be said about her work um, that are not so positive, but I think there are some things that are really, really important that she makes visible. Um, thank you for that. Uh, another aspect of the book that you, you explore is there's the increasingly common claim of this idea of um, uh, Christianity is queer. A Christianity is inherently queer. And I, and I, I admit, in, the, in conversations around faith and sex and gender, I've, I, I've explored this lie when I've talked with um, you know, people I've been working with. Um, but you kind of talk about how there's a, I mean, a problematic element when queer is kind of synonymous with odd, when queer has been used to, to, um, as a refer to oddity. Um, could you help us, I guess, yeah, just understand or, or talk through a bit this issue, um, this issue with the Christianity is queer approach? Yeah, um, there's, this is one of my favorite, favorite subjects because there's so much to be said about it in different directions, but the short version would go something like this. One of the reasons people start making the claim Christianity is queer is a defensive move. It's a defensive and an apologetic move. It's a defensive move in terms of the critiques of Christianity that have emerged in a variety of contexts in terms of its investment in sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. It's also an apologetic move that, that wants to say queerness has always been here. And of course, there's, there's one way in which you can make that claim that I think is pretty convincing, which is something like this. Any complex symbol system is going to be queer in some way, right? That's the nature of complex symbol systems. If they weren't both um, unstable and inconsistent in certain ways, they wouldn't work because they wouldn't be adequate to the reality that they intend to organize. So you can make the sort of claim, oh, there's queerness here because these categories aren't fixed, there's movement between different categories, etc. Now, is there anything interesting about making that claim? I don't really think so, at least anything interesting beyond showing that this is how a variety of um, socio-symbolic organizations stay in place. Uh, you know, there's an important queer theorist who has shown that homophobic discourse works by contradiction. So you can't use contradiction to destabilize homophobic discourse. Contradiction is the means by which it lives. And so many of these attempts to show how Christianity is queer either have to do with something like, you know, contradiction look or what, what, what people would call transgression of binaries or something like that, right? And the thing is, binaries don't work by being fixed either. That, that, otherwise, they wouldn't have any power to organize reality because reality isn't like that, right? And so it's not that I think that there's no truth to statements like, Christianity is queer. I just don't think they're very illuminating or useful in general um, because they, they, they are so general in a certain sense. They are, they are so much about what would necessarily be the case in any complex symbol system, in any complex form of organization, of imagination. Um, and it doesn't really tell us much about with why Christianity would be particularly so or uh, the particular ways in which Christianity is queer. Further, um, I get the recuperative desire, I get the desire to rescue Christianity from its history in certain ways. I'm just not sure I want to be part of that project because again, the only Christianity we have is the Christianity there has been. And the Christianity there has been, has been a major actor in the enforcement of sexual and gender norms, and maybe most obviously in terms of ordination and colonization, the Christianity we actually have 
used sexual and gendered norms as a tool for violence in very direct ways. And so to say Christianity is inherently queer or something like that, it's also a very idealist and idealizing claim, I think. And, and that kind of idealism and that kind of idealizing is pretty antithetical to queer theory as I understand it. And also, here's my, again, sort of more, um, uh, uh, the easier to see theological side, also kind of untrue theologically um, as well. Yeah, no, I think that is, it was so helpful and illuminating to read that section of the book. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, so, so while not like that, that statement has, has issues, what you kind of explore right toward the end of the book is um, while uh, they both have an interest in finitude, both have yeah. a, a, an attraction to thinking about finitude and, and exploring what does it mean to live in the shadow of death? Uh, so I guess my question is, you know, we're recording this in the week after Holy Week. Um, you know, how might this shared interest, uh, you know, shape the church's approach, uh, I guess, to Holy Week, but also maybe the weeks after Holy Week? Yeah, yeah. Well, part of this is, is, is the question of uh, resurrection, right? Hmm. Whatever you think that means in Christianity, um, that's a tricky debate that continues to be a debate in all kinds of ways. Arguably, I think resurrection is where uh, Christianity and at least queer theory and maybe the things that people are often interested in around queerness would maybe uh, need to part company to some extent. But that still leaves a lot of life in a certain sense prior to resurrection or in anticipation of resurrection where there might be much to learn and much to understand. And some of it would have to do exactly with uh, the dynamics we've been talking about, the production of hierarchies that are destructive of possibilities of human flourishing, but also not sort of going to a kind of escapist form of human flourishing, this idea that, you know, if we could all just get along, then everything would be better and, and, and so on and so forth. And instead wrestling with the intractability of some of these things. The sort of motif that has been so important for my own thinking that comes from the theorist Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, humans are, people are different from each other. Uh, it's amazing how few good theoretical tools we have for dealing with this simple fact, she says. That's not quite an exact quote, but it's close. And I think about that a lot. People are different from each other. And it's amazing how few good theoretical tools we have for dealing with this simple fact. Because what we often mean by that is something much more like people are different from each other and that's a good thing and, and, and so on and so forth. But a lot of human differences are conflictual. A lot of human differences are antagonism. A lot of human differences are real disagreements about what humans should be like, how society should be organized financially, socially, religiously, and in any number of other ways. And there may be resources in queer theory for thinking about not how to make those differences nonviolent, but for how to make them somewhat less violent. And Christianity has a lot to say about that too, I think, at least potentially. You know, theologians often like to talk about the fact that there's no theory of salvation in the New Testament, right? There's no soteriology. There's just Jesus saves somehow, right? <laughs> yeah. A kind of essence, right? <laughs> and there's also some real perspectival differences in the Bible around some of these questions. Ecclesiastes, of course, standing out as, as a very particular, um, uh, as a way of living in a world where death really is the end, right? That's, that's a story that Ecclesiastes uh, has to tell. There are many different stories about this in the Bible, and of course, historians of the Bible tell us that belief in, in resurrection only emerged quite late in the writing of, of the texts that came to be included in the Christian Bible. And what that means in part is that our source material, Jesus's life, Paul's practices, histories of engagement with and destruction of groups of people who are different from each other and so on, 
there's a lot of rich source material in, in the place to, that Christians are instructed to sort of go back to, they search the scriptures daily, um, to, for thinking about these kinds of issues, but in ways that wouldn't simply kind of escape to resurrection or something like that. There is something that's important about how resurrection and belief in resurrection can again allow for a kind of fearlessness, potentially, in life now. And so can the belief that death is the end. Both of those can involve a certain kind of fearlessness in how you live, or a way to be present in your life and present to the people around you that recognizes that these forms of presence, these ways of living, affection and conflict and disagreement and so on, are both what life is and non-ultimate in a certain way, because they will all come to an end in one way or another. And that means that you can be free inside them. That there's a possibility for, again, I, my language is aiming at the better there, that doesn't require you to find some way of escaping conflict and escaping disagreement and escaping difficulty, but that lets you be without um, kind of subjecting yourself to an idea of perfection or finality and instead recognizing a kind of shared well, we're all in this mess and somehow we need to try and make it as best it can be. Um, that, that, that seems to have a lot of potential for me as a, as a way of living, Christianly and, and not. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That's really, really profound. So I really appreciate it. Um, one final little question is, it's a new segment we've been playing on Love Roots Repeat with a few guests, um, which is our segment Pairings, uh, insert music cue. Um, okay. uh, which is basically I, I ask you for a pairings to go with your book. So we've got, we need a meal, a good, you know, someone sitting down to read the book, a good meal, uh, as they prepare that meal, a song, a song that pairs well, uh, with the, with the book uh, and then having read the book, um, a, another book that pairs well. So a meal, a song and a book that pair with queer theology. Wow, that's hard. Okay, uh, uh, give me a second. Let me no see. worries. No worries. For a meal, I would say it's not so much a matter of what, but with whom. Mm. That the book is is read is meant to be in a certain sense read. I don't want to say communally exactly, but that so much of what we've been talking about is about how we relate to each other. So I would say you should be preparing a meal with friends. I guess that would be my first. Nice. Uh, and the second part would probably be that, uh, you know, I am a big fan of the sort of fresh seasonal blah, blah, blah. So the meal should be prepared in a fresh seasonal way that recognizes the incredible economic privilege that it is to pay attention to that sort of thing <laughs> or something like that. Um, nice. So that'd be the first one. The song, ah, uh, maybe the song by Anani, formerly known as Anthony of Anthony and the Johnsons. Um, uh, I think it's called, uh, at least one of the lyrics is for today I'm a boy. That would maybe be the song I'd go with. All right, sounds good. And then another book to pair, it's almost going to have to be Marcella. Uh, it's it's hard to avoid that. But if I was going to say something other than uh, indecent theology, it would probably be uh, a book that I talk about in there, a book that would have benefited enormously from an editor, but that I think at its core has a lot to say that the Theological Academy would benefit from. And that's Jeffrey Reese's book, The Romance of Innocent Sexuality. Great. Thank you for playing pairings. And, uh, and I that was even, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I probably should like, maybe that's what I could, I could um, queue up people in advance that it's going to happen. Maybe it's fun if you don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's something about being, being on the spot and seeing what comes. Um, and then you can just, you know, spend the rest of the day thinking that song or that song. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. That is a very accurate prediction of what my near future is going to look like. <laughs> well, Thank you for this interview today. I, I, it's been 
so illuminating. And if, and if you're listening and you think, oh, wow, we've touched on everything. No, we have it. There's so yeah. much more in this book. It's, it's so rich and so deep and, and it truly uh, has shifted and challenged and, and provoked my thinking on so many topics. So I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Uh, and, it's, and it's not overly long and it's certainly not overly expensive. So queer theology, I, I, I highly recommend to you all. Uh, anything else you want to plug, uh, Lynn, before? Any other ways we can connect with you? Uh, nothing at this point in time. I'm in the chaos part of my next book. So this is the sort of crying out from the depths of misery into there will be something eventually, but that eventually is not right now. Sure, uh, but I just want to say thank you too for this conversation, which I really, really enjoyed. And thank you too for the engagement with the book, which is more than I could have hoped for, but absolutely delightful to, to have. So thank you. You're welcome. Well, uh, thank you and, and good luck in the chaos. Thanks, I appreciate it.